I know that everyone doesn't uh, normally use the inserts for the sermons, but I hope you will for the next four weeks. Um, at least you have them. I forgot to email them to Juanita, so we didn't have them in the first service, but uh, uh, Daryl and Ed took care of getting them ready for this service. I appreciate that. I am doing a Christmas series in November, so don't be a hater. I have asked the musicians to not sing Christmas music in November, but we're doing a Christmas sermon series, and we're doing it for a good reason. We're four weeks away from Advent, what uh, others call the beginning of the Christmas season, we call Advent. And I want us to be ready for Advent. I want us to be ready to bring Christ into our culture. I want us to be ready to incarnate Christ into our culture. The incarnation is what Christmas is a celebration of. And I want us to be ready to do that and ready to not get involved in the petty squabbles that often accompany the holiday of Christmas. And one reason we're doing this, or another reason we're doing this a month early, is I have preached this series before. And when I did, I did it in Advent. And I realized the series is so application heavy that if I wait till Advent, it doesn't give us time to put into practice everything uh, that we're talking about. So that's why we're doing Christmas in November. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, keeping Christ in Christmas. You may have seen the title on the insert. That becomes a battle cry for some people within the church in December. We've got to keep Christ in Christmas. The humanists are trying to take Christ out of Christmas. The secularists are trying to take Christ out of Christmas. Atheists don't even believe in Christ, but they're trying to take him out of Christmas anyway. And we're going to talk about some practical ways to keep Christ in Christmas that do not involve getting, uh, getting involved in petty squabbles. And the first thing we need to remember is that the statement, keeping Christ in Christmas, is a practical statement. It is not a theological statement. Keeping Christ in Christmas is about our behavior. So it's practical. It is not about truth, because truthfully and theologically, Christmas without Christ is not Christmas, right? Christmas truly without Christ is not Christmas. However, in our culture, Christmas has become two separate holidays. There is the church's Christmas, the celebration of the incarnation. And then there is the secular Christmas, the celebration of accumulation. And for us to expect a non-Christian to celebrate the Christian Christmas, to use our language, to do things our way, makes no sense. Because we can't even do it without the Holy Spirit in us. So to expect a Christian to behave, or a non-Christian to behave in the way we consider proper is ridiculous because they don't have the Holy Spirit to guide them. And it makes no more sense than a Jewish person expecting us to celebrate Hanukkah during this time of the month. It just doesn't make sense. And keeping Christ in Christmas, as I've already alluded, does not involve getting in arguments over words and letters. And the words that we argue about at this time of year are happy holidays. Christians on Facebook get so upset about that. I see bumper stickers. This person does not say happy holidays. This person says Merry Christmas. Get used to it. Well, let's parse that bumper sticker. This person does not say happy holidays. Fine, not a problem. This person says Merry Christmas. Great. I hope that's what you all say. Get used to it. Not very Christmassy, is it? Certainly not very Christ-like. I see that and I think, man, this person is a Grinch. This person is a Scrooge. I don't want to go caroling with them. And I hope that they get coal in their stocking when the time comes. And some people, such as store clerks, people in the business world, have to say happy holidays because they have been told by their employers, you have to say happy holidays. Now this doesn't mean we can't say Merry Christmas to them, but we can't get upset when somebody says happy holidays because often they're under orders to do so. 
and both Ledgewood and Wilkesbury, where Linda and I live, there is some slight diversity in the communities. So at this time of year, if you don't know a person, you don't know what, um, what holiday they're celebrating. They might be celebrating Christmas. They might be celebrating Hanukkah. Since 1966, they might be celebrating Kwanzaa. Since the Seinfeld uh, TV show, they might be celebrating Festivus. We just don't know. I gotta tell you, the first service laughs at my jokes a whole lot better than you guys do. <laughs> and I, it's definitely your fault, because I'm the constant between the two. But just showing respect is very Christian. Christian is not the time to go, or Christmas is not the time to go on the offensive and attack people for not speaking, not doing the way we should. Christmas is, is a magical time, both the secular Christmas and the real Christmas. And even non-Christians are more open to the spiritual this time of year, or I shouldn't say this time of year, we're not there yet, sorry about that. But uh, beginning at one second after midnight on Thanksgiving, and we'll consider that the, the Christmas season. Um, even non-Christians are more open to Jesus this time of year. So instead of going on the offensive and getting upset about little things, this is the time for us to be more gentle and more compassionate and more understanding and more Christ-like. That's the words we fight about at Christmas. What is the letter we fight about at Christmas? X, Xmas. A lot of Christians think that the use of Xmas is a secular humanist attempt to remove Jesus Christ from Christmas. Franklin Graham even once said it is a direct attack on the name of Jesus Christ. But there is a long history going almost all the way back to the very beginning of the church of using an X to symbolize Jesus Christ or at least Christ, and I'll tell you why. You may see in your, uh, your insert a word that makes no sense to you. You're lucky. In the first service, I wrote that on a whiteboard, and if my handwriting is bad in English, it's worse in Greek. But that is Greek for the word Christos, which means anointed one. It means the same as the Hebrew Messiah, and we transliterate it as Christ. That's the word we get. It's not Jesus' last name, it is his title. And what does that first letter look like? It looks like an X, because basically it is an X. It's a key. The second letter is an R, it's a row. Some of you might be familiar with the Christian symbol, the key row. That looks like a P with an X on the stem. That is the first two letters of the name, of, or of, of the title Christ in Greek. So as far back as almost the very earliest church, when the church started facing persecution, if they couldn't openly talk about Christ, an X on a building representing Christos could mean this is a place where Christians meet. Ancient Christian art, you'll find an X or an XR to represent the title Christ, anointed one. Some of the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, you find X or XR or key and key row, just as a shortened version of Christos. Like if you were to look at my handwritten notes when I research a sermon and when I study a text, every now and then you'd see HS. Well, it doesn't mean high school, doesn't mean hot stuff, it means Holy Spirit. It's just a shortened way, it's just, it's, what do you call that, shorthand to make my notes a little more legible for me. The word Christ and its compounds, Christianity, Christians, have been used by Christians in one form of English or another for at least a thousand years. There are records in Anglo-Saxon writings of using X for Christ as far back as 1021. And I don't mean October 21st. I mean 1021 AD. The Oxford English Dictionary cites the usage of X and XR to represent Christ as far back as 1485. And X-I-A-N-T-Y for Christianity as far back as 1634. The Christian use of Xmas in particular dates all the way back to the 16th century. 
So Xmas, using Xmas is not some attempt to remove Christ from Christmas. Now there might be people who think they're doing that and when they're posting on Facebook or they're posting their blog or they're tweeting, they're smugly writing Xmas thinking they're insulting us Christians. What they're doing is continuing a Christian tradition that's been going on for almost 2,000 years. So Xmas is not an attempt to take Christ out of Christmas. But even if it were, even if it were an attempt to remove Christ from Christmas, getting involved in arguments about it for us would be trivial. It makes us look petty. It ruins our influence. It shows that the world is reflecting us, or uh, influencing us, rather than us influencing the world. And anyway, as we've already said, even if Christ were removed, Christmas without Christ is not really Christmas. It is Christmas, a secular holiday of gift giving and good cheer and debt accumulation. But it's empty of Jesus Christ. So we're in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. We're going to start with verses 9 through 11. And as we read these, I want you to listen for what truly matters. I want you to listen for a practical way that we can keep Christ in Christmas this year. The true light, Jesus Christ, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, which we first see in verse 3, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. Though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Jesus Christ was not recognized by the very world that he himself created. We don't expect a pot to recognize its potter. We do not expect a painting to recognize its painter. We don't expect a cookie to recognize its baker. We do not expect a poem to recognize its author. But we should recognize God and Jesus Christ, even if we have never heard about him. I want to read for you, uh, you can just listen to this. This is Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation, from the very beginning, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, and otherwise creation itself, so that people are without excuse. Paul's saying that even if someone never hears the gospel, and maybe they can't put it into words, just by looking at creation, we should know there's a God. And he loves us. And he's done some great stuff. And he is extremely powerful. Even if we have not heard about him, we should recognize him. And yet, John says, Christ, God incarnate, was not recognized by most people when he came to earth. In verse 10, the word world, some version of the word cosmos, is used three times. And the first two times, it's literal. It refers to creation. Jesus was coming into the world. Jesus came into the world. But the third time, when the word world is used in verse 10, it is metaphorical. The world did not recognize him. And God's not, or John is not talking about creation. Creation recognizes its creator. In this instance, the word world means those who oppose God. There's the faith community and there's the world. And the world are those who oppose and reject God. And so Jesus was not recognized by those who oppose him, those who rejected him. And yet God sent him anyway, knowing that most people would reject him. God sent him anyway. John 3.16, very popular passage of scripture. For God so loved the world. Yes, God loves creation, but he's not talking about creation. John's not talking about creation. When he says God so loved the world, he sent his only son. 
by the world, he means those who oppose Jesus, those who oppose God. And yet, God loved the world so much, those who oppose him, that he sent Jesus. Romans 5.8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait for us to get better. We can't get better. While we are his enemies, while we were opposed to him, God sent Christ to die in our place and to achieve our forgiveness. And God sent him knowing that he would be unrecognized. And not only was he unrecognized by the world, Jesus was rejected by his own people. Verse 11 tells us this. The Jews have been waiting for the Messiah for centuries, for generations. And you'd think when the Messiah finally arrived, this would be a huge deal. But beyond a few shepherds and a few kings and some animals, nobody really knew much about it. You'd think it would have been this huge deal, but he didn't come the way they expected the Messiah to come. And so they didn't recognize him. Now, I'm not just blaming the Jews for this. Since that time, billions of people have not recognized Jesus as the Messiah. But they've been waiting and looking, and, and they should have recognized him when he came. Jesus was facing uh, rejection even before he was born. You might remember reading in the Gospels, when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant, he decided to what? To divorce her quietly. Joseph was going to reject Jesus because he didn't know the whole story yet. And then they get to Bethlehem, and what are the famous words? There was no room at the inn. Rejection defines Jesus' life and ministry. You keep Christ in Christmas by sharing his love with someone who will most likely reject you. Not by fighting over words and letters. You keep Christ in Christmas by sharing his love with someone who will most likely reject you. He was rejected, so the chances are we are going to be rejected. When you live like Christ, you will be rejected like Christ. Because the world does not want us living like Christ. But what would happen if we did? Especially at the time of year that is approaching. What would happen if you were to incarnate Christ into the life of someone grieving at Christmas? This is a terrible time of the year to experience loss or to remember loss. And it used to be just December. Then it was Thanksgiving through the end of December. Now it's by the end of October, people are feeling the Christmas pressure because of the commercials and everything. And it's just a terrible time to grieve because everybody else at least appears, a lot of people are faking, but at least appears happy and joyful and joyous and here you are crying over loss. What would it look like if you were to incarnate Christ into the life of somebody grieving? What would it look like if you were to incarnate Christ into the life of those shoppers who are willing to fight for a place in line or a particular toy? And you know, fight, when you used to preach on this 20 years ago, that was a metaphor, fight for a place in line. Now it's literal. You've seen the videos, right? People actually pounding on each other, women fighting each other. And you know what they're trying to buy with those toys and those, those trinkets? Happiness. Does it work? No, because if it worked last Christmas, they wouldn't be storming the stores again this Christmas. They would be happy. What would it look like if you were to incarnate Christ into the life of somebody overwhelmed by the expectations of the holiday? You gotta have the perfect tree and you gotta have the perfect gifts and you gotta have the perfect uh, Christmas card to send out and, and your kids have to dress perfect for school. Some people can't afford that. A lot of people can't afford that. Some people go into debt trying to keep up with the Joneses and people just get overwhelmed by the cultural expectations. So what would it look like if you were to become Christ into their life? What would it look like if you were to bring Christ into your family? Holidays can be a fantastic time for families. Holidays can be a terrible time for families. 
and you get everybody together with the expectation that everything's going to be wonderful, even though it has never been wonderful before, we think it's going to be different this time, and terrible things can happen. But what would it look like if you brought Christ into that situation? What would it look like if you were to incarnate Christ into the life of somebody lonely? This is a terrible time of the year to be lonely. It's like grieving, you know? You, you turn on the TV, and there's all these commercials, and Hallmark Channel with 24 hours a day uh, movies, originals, about people who are uh, with their friends, and they're with their families, and they're all together, and they're all beautiful, and they're all dressed beautifully, and they're having these beautiful parties, and everything's beautiful, and you're sitting at home with your TV dinner by yourself. Or you're sitting in your office, and nobody's talking to you. Or you're at school, and no one's paying attention to you. And everybody else around you looks like their life is perfect. What would it look like if you brought Christ into that life? What would it look like if you incarnated Christ into the life of someone who is lost? I've already said Christmas is a, a magical time. And it's a very spiritual time. And even those who are not Christians are more open to Christ at this time of year. And while I normally preach slow and steady in evangelism, this time of year can call for a different approach because somebody may just be ready in the moment and we've got to be ready to bring Christ to that lost person. When you bring Christ to someone, rejection is a true possibility. Jesus was rejected, so we're going to be rejected when we bring Jesus. It just makes sense. But in that rejection, hear Jesus saying to you, it's not you, it's me. It's not you they're rejecting, it's me. Now, we may be the ones who get uninvited from the Christmas parties, but it's Jesus whom they have truly rejected. But not everyone rejects him. And if you could see my notes up here, that sentence is typed in bold and italics and it's underlined in red. Not everyone rejects him. Some people that you bring Christ to will accept him. Let's go back to John 1, read verses 12 through 14. Verses that tell us that this risk, this risk of rejection is worth it. He has just talked, John has just talked about those who did not receive or recognize Christ. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Risking rejection for the sake of Jesus Christ is worth it. Because not everybody is going to reject you. John says that those who believed him and received him became children of God. Believing Jesus is recognizing who he is. The Son of God, the Lord, the Savior, the King, the Messiah. Receiving him is recognizing who he is for me. My Lord, my Savior, my King, my Messiah. And there are people who will respond to you incarnating Christ into their lives during Christmas. Not everyone will reject you. Jesus, God incarnate, was rejected by most, but received by some. You know, when we open up to the book of Acts, Jesus has had a three-year earthly ministry. What do we find? 120 believers. About the number of people who were in church this morning, counting both services. After three years, 120. But we know he encountered tens of thousands. So he came and he was rejected by most, but he was received by some. And when you take Christ into people's lives, you will be rejected, perhaps by most. But some will accept you in the message and the Christ you bring. And when they do, their lives will be changed. When you bring Jesus into the life of the grieving, they'll find comfort. Comfort that's not going to come from any words we can say or from the right Christmas gift or from a, a card signed with your name. Comfort that comes to the grieving only through Jesus Christ. 
from the Son of God who understands what it is like to lose a loved one. Who knows exactly what it's like. When you incarnate Christ into someone's life, those bargain hunters who are trying to buy happiness can find joy. Happiness is based on the moment. It's based on an object. It's based on a life situation. Joy comes from knowing that you're a child of God and that God loves you and that Jesus came for you. When you incarnate Jesus, the overwhelmed can find rest. That's what the overwhelmed need. And we can tell them to slow down. We can tell them not to pay attention to the commercials, but they're going to see a whole, lot, a, whole, a whole bunch more commercials and a whole bunch more movies on TV than they're going to hear from us. But with Jesus Christ, the one who himself rested from time to time, had to get away to pray, the overwhelmed can find rest. Family members can find healing. You know, you can spend years, decades trying to work out stuff within your family. And the thing is, is all families fall into patterns. There are trigger words. There are trigger looks on the face. And man, in my family, I could write a whole paper on them. I know what they are. I can predict them. I can tell you when they will happen. How long it will take after we get home. But when Jesus enters that situation, the great physician can bring healing to souls and to relationships that we can't do on our own. The lonely can find love when you incarnate Christ because that's what we're missing when we're lonely. We're missing being loved. And when you incarnate Christ into a lonely person's life, they find the ultimate love, the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ. And of course, when you incarnate Christ, when you keep Christ in Christmas, the lost will find salvation. They will find the ultimate gift of Jesus Christ. And that more than anything makes it worthwhile, worth taking the risk of rejection to keep Christ in Christmas. Any rejection you risk is worth it because there is always the possibility that you will be bringing Jesus Christ into someone's life for the first time. And they may very well respond. About 30 years ago, in a magazine called uh, The U.S. Catholic, Father Henry Farron wrote, Christmas took over a pagan celebration, which it did. And now a non-Christian world is trying to make it into a purely secular festival again. But real Christians will keep Christ and therefore they will keep Christmas. Some years ago, there was a campaign to put Christ back into Christmas, but Christ never left the real Christmas. Christmas may be an oasis, but at least it is a time when love is made manifest. Christ never left the real Christmas. I love that. Christ cannot be removed from the real Christmas. And if it were possible for Christ to be removed from the real Christmas, it would not be through the work of secularists and humanists and atheists who get upset at words and letters. It would happen because of the negligence of Christians. People like you and I who allow ourselves to get sidetracked by petty issues. To keep Christ in Christmas this year. And now you see why I'm preaching this in November. To give you time to build up to this and to get ready for this and to pray about this. To keep Christ in Christmas this year, incarnate Christ. Bring Christ into the life of someone grieving. Someone unhappy. Someone overwhelmed. A broken family. Someone lonely. Someone lost. Perhaps most of them will reject you, but not all of them will. And when someone accepts you and the message and the Christ that you're bringing with you, then the incarnation, God becoming a human, the incarnation will suddenly become very, very, very real. That is keeping Christ in Christmas. Amen.